Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this evening, and thank you, virtual audience, for joining us. What a pleasure it is to have Rupert Holmes back with our third book together. Yeah. And I think, I think it was 2007 when you were here with Swing, except you were at our other store. That was at the other location with, you, with, with piano. Yeah. No, it was bigger than that. You had a keyboard, but you had... Oh, yeah, piano. no. You with, had with, two with a band. Yeah, it was a band. I usually, yeah. I thought I'd have a band here today. I <laughs> requested an accordion <laughs> and, uh, and, a, and a brass section. And we let you down. Unless he's the brass section. <laughs> Now, that one of the great things about Swing was that Rupert actually incorporated some of his musical talent mm -hmm. into Swing. I I did indeed. I did indeed. It was a, it was I probably one of the few novelists who ever got to say I'd like to sing you a song from my novel, <laughs> <laughs> which was uh, an unusual circumstance. Well, let's go back and talk about the first book because that is the one where we actually met. Right. And it, Long ago, it was mm -hmm. our first mystery book back, when was that, like 2004 something yes. like that? 2004 sounds right. Yeah, that is right. So tell us a little bit about that one. Can you even remember it? Uh, um, yes, it was about um, a woman who had no name, and she was haunted by a, a, the previous wife of, of Max named Rebecca. And, no, that's a different book. <laughs> <laughs> that's Rebecca. Yeah, I try to say I wrote. Um, you want no, me to look up his <laughs> No, I, I remember it quite well. Uh, although when I saw the movie they made of it, I didn't remember that being what it was. Um, uh, yeah, I wrote a, uh, um, uh, my first novel was called Where the Truth Lies, and um, they made a motion picture of it. Uh, Adam Goyan, the acclaimed director who had uh, done The Sweet Hereafter, he acquired the um, film rights to it while it was still in ring binder, Barbara. Right. I mean, that's amazing. It was just in a ring binder. It was, it had, I had a deal with Random House at that time, uh, but it wasn't even in uh, advanced reader copy form. And he uh, acquired it. And then we had a wonderful uh, dinner at uh, the Plaza Hotel where he explained to me that he writes all his own screenplays. And um, there was one day where I got to visit the set, and that was kind of thrilling, uh, to see, you know, 400 extras in period <coughs> costume uh, at a mock telephone, uh, telephone and, uh, and, and they're all in, in period clothing, and I thought, I typed all this in my kitchen, and here it is real, you know. Um, and it starred Colin Firth and uh -huh. Kevin Bacon, and Colin Firth gave me the loveliest gift. He gave me an inscribed copy of my own novel in which he said uh, he feared that he would be the victim of novel envy. <laughs> that as an actor, he thought that the best version of his role was possibly between the covers of, uh, of my novel. But, you know, James M. Cain, who wrote uh, Double Indemnity and Postman Always Rings Twice and Mildred Pierce, um, all those were great movies. And someone once said to him, how do you feel about what Hollywood did to your novel? And he said, Hollywood did nothing to my novel. My novels are all right here. Uh, right. I can read them all. If you want to read them, what I wrote, they're right there. So the movie wasn't like much of a reflection. I had this very strange day of my life where they had finished the film. And they said, would you like to see it? I'd seen nothing except that one day on the set. And so I sat down in a screening room. There was no one else there. And someone rolled a motion picture of a book that I had had, that had existed solely in my imagination. And now it was going to be real and realized um, on, 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 this, on the screen. And there were moments where it was sort of what I had envisioned. And then there were moments where I thought, oh no, not that, <laughs> no. And, you know, someone said, this is true of me, um, someone said to Hemingway, is there much difference between the movie of your novel and your novel? He said, no, hardly anything. I mean, in my book, The Hero Dies, and in the movie, he lives. But other than that, <laughs> there's no difference. And it was sort of that way for me, too. Yeah. Uh, but it was an interesting story about, um, basically about um, a, a, a comedy duo who I patterned after Martin and Lewis. No secret about that. Uh, Vince Collins and Lanny Morris instead of 
Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. Years later, and, and by the way, about a, a strange, mysterious death that had occurred when they were at the peak of their um, partnership, and for some reason, something about the circumstances of the death of someone who was found in their hotel suite, who they apparently did not know, caused the breakup of the relationship, just as in real life, Martin Lewis had split up, and we could never, as a boy, I couldn't bear that. We thought they were the best friends in the world, and suddenly they weren't talking to each other. So that was the basis of the mystery. And years later, um, and some rather sordid things happened in the novel, because part of it's set in the 70s, and I was there in show business in the 70s, and it, it could range to the sordid. And um, Jerry Lewis, um, that Marvin Hamlish, the great composer, asked me to write a musical with him of Jerry Lewis's classic comedy, The Nutty Professor. And so the next thing I know, I'm meeting Jerry Lewis, and he says, I'd like a copy of your book. And I thought, oh no, <laughs> what happens when you get to chapter 35? <laughs> oh no, and I kept waiting every day that we met and worked together for Jerry to come in and say, how could you write that about us? And then one day I realized, oh, he's not gonna really read my book, he just wants a copy of it, but it's not like he's gonna sit and read through the whole thing. So we had a wonderful relationship, and we were the best of friends, and my boyhood hero, and uh, that was, so that's the whole story of that. Do you have enough time for me to even get to the second book? We do. <laughs> I was just thinking that reminds me of, um, of Don Winslow, who when he took um, an early Hollywood meeting afterward, um, came away and said to me, you know, I offered them a copy of my book, and they said to me, or the guy said to me, I have people who read. Yeah. Oh. Because, you know, just like yeah. The There's a great line in the musical City of Angels where a Hollywood producer says, I'm a big fan of your work. I've read synopses of everything you've ever written. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, look, can I go back farther in time? Because you can't, but I just want to add oh, to that. All right. Go. No, I just want to add to that that with Murder Your Employer, my new book, um, already there were at least, before it came out, there were 20 major producing entities in Hollywood. Uh, who all wanted to option this uh, as a streaming series. And I really, even as I wrote it, I thought Murder Your Employer and the world of McMaster's, the, this conservatory uh, or um, a finishing school for finishing people off. Um, uh, they, I thought it would make a wonderful series. And I would do these Zoom conference calls, Barbara, and there would always be four people on the screen. And one would be the head of the production company, the second would be uh, their um, right-hand person. There would be the other one who was like the cost accountant. And then there would be some young intern, usually female, uh, maybe 21 to 23 years of age in the lower corner. And we would talk about the book. And every time I said anything about the book, it was the young intern who would go, yeah, yeah, she was the only one who had read it. They're all saying, we think this is a marvelous opera, but what a great book. Uh, and I'd say, how about the ending? Oh, the ending. That was an ending. <laughs> so when I said, no, now it's over because it's ended. And meanwhile, I'd say, well, what do you think of the deed? And she and the intern in the lower right hand corner, she had typed the memo that they were all working off of from notes in many, many instances. Uh, OK, sorry. I, no, it's fine. Why don't you elaborate on your point? I was laughing because I'll bet you she was older than that. But the trouble is, at our age, we think everybody is. No, <laughs> no I've got it doesn't people. really work that way. I, I've, got, I've, got, I've got people that I have a, a lot of interns that work with me. So I have a pretty good grasp of the, of the age group. And um, it, when people are fresh out of college, it's when they work, they do all the work for like I know. $150. There's been, a, there's been a big strike going on in New York about the you know, oh, yeah? salaries. So yeah. Yeah. Major publishers have grudgingly, in New York City, given everybody a $3,000 a year raise, which means they might occasionally be able to go to McDonald's. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Because mostly they're living four people in a room. Exactly. Um, you know, because they need. So I want to go back to the mystery of Edwin Drood, which okay. is when I first fell in love with you. When did that? show up on Broadway. What year was it? Well, it's been twice on Broadway. Well, the, the first time. The first time was 19, um, it was uh, it debuted in 1985, December of 1985. In the spring of 1986, it won the Tony Awards for um, Best Musical, uh, Best Folk, which I wrote, I'm pleased to say, 
Best Lyrics, which um, I think I also wrote, and Best Music, which I also wrote. Oh, I'd be happy to know that. <laughs> <laughs> you were there. I was there. But that first one? Uh, probably not the premiere performance, but certainly in its first run, because it was a horror. It won the challenge. Well, I must have been a thrill at age six to have attended my first, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my first Broadway show, Barbara. Okay. You would never see that. I was actually a devotee of the Metropolitan Opera, but I snuck over. To oh. but anyway, I went to see The Mystery of Edwin Drood, and I was absolutely captivated. Did have any of you seen it, or do you know why? Okay, you well, know, I'll act you know, it all up. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, right. Do you know who Edwin Drood, do you know the book by Dickens? was the book that he was writing when he died. Um, so nobody really knows how Dickens would have ended uh, Edmund Drew. Mm -hmm. And it is a murder mystery. There are interesting things going on. So Rupert taking advantage of this, I mean, it was just so glorious. And I was completely unprepared for it. I'm watching along. The play progresses along, you know, sort of the lines of the book. And the cast are absolutely great. And then all of a sudden, it comes to a halt. That is not over. And then the cast comes out and they lobby the audience to make them the lead character in whatever ending we're going to. Did they each have an assigned ending? Was that the. I'm trying to remember. They it's, did, it's, they? it's an incredibly complex work for, no for an actor. I, I don't mean. I'm not trying to praise but myself. They, I they just, never knew until the audience it voted kept, which one of them would end up. In its Broadway run, the actors never got tired of going to the theater because each night, at every performance, matinee and evening, they had no idea if they would be the star of the show right. at the end, or if they would be relegated to a, a secondary role. And uh, and each night they had to be on their turn. And certain, the way I con conceived it, as long as each actor knew multiple options of songs they might sing, lyrics they might uh, sing, explanations they might give, were they chosen? There are three key questions that the audience votes on. Um, who is the uh, detective in disguise that Dickens created and never told us who it was? Uh, who are the lovers at the end of the story, which is 36 combinations of love scenes? Uh, and who is the murderer, from which there is a, a list of ten, nine, which grew to ten? And someone calculated that there are technically 450-something different combinations of endings to the show. And there are still some to this day, even after the Broadway revival in 2012 and 2013, that I have uh, never seen. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's great because neither I, nor the orchestra, nor the conductor, nor the cast, nor the director have any idea on any given perform at any given performance What's going to happen at the end? Do they have to ad lib to string it together? No ad libs. I actually, it's, all, script, all, it's script? all scripted. Now, every now and then, as is the case with all actors, they may want to improve the play slightly. <laughs> Oscar Wilde once attended the importance of being earnest. Uh, uh, no, sorry, it, it was, uh, it was uh, George Kaufman in a play that he wrote. That's right. George Kaplan attended a, 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 a performance of the Broadway show he'd written uh, about a month after he left the show. And he came back to see it again, and he sent a telegram to the actor at intermission saying, watching the show from the back, wish you were here. <laughs> <laughs> and Oscar, Oscar Wilde, what he did, he saw the importance of being earnest about a month after some actors decided their roles could be improved with a couple of improvs. And uh, after the show, someone said, how did you like it? He said, oh, it's wonderful. It very much resembles a play I once wrote. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So there are occasional ad libs, but no, it's all the lines are covered. Um, and it meant that I had to write a three-act musical, Barbara, of which on any given evening, only two acts are seen. And I also did the orchestrations for it, for a 27-piece orchestra back then. So it meant I had to make pencil marks knowing that Every flute part, every oboe part might not be heard at a specific performance or ever. So, um, but it was it was my first musical, and I didn't know you couldn't do this, so I did it. After I did it, I learned you can't do it, but I did. So it worked out.
It was really incredibly fun. I have to say that when we got to which one of them was going to be the murderer, the actors lobbied the hardest. Yes, they, oh. they really pitched it to us, you know, make me the murderer yeah. because. Yeah. So I was so enchanted. I went back another night to see, and, and as you say, it was completely different because it all depended on, on what the audience decided, which I thought was remarkable. Then, to continue, Rupert had a play here in Phoenix that was absolutely superb. It's called Say Goodnight, Gracie. It was kind enough to... Was that when the second book came out? Or I know you... It was just, I think, just before the first... I know you gave me tickets. Yeah. And my husband and I went. And yeah. I absolutely loved it. It was George Burns and Gracie Allen. Mm -hmm. And it was um, it was another. It was down at the Herberger. Yeah. And it was absolutely wonderful. So I've, I've spent as much time with Rupert as a playwright and a musician than I have as a novelist. Yeah, it's right. Good. So yeah. here we are with the point of this evening, really, just to talk about the McMaster's Guide to Homicide, which I have to tell you is the New York Times bestseller. And currently there are no copies because they've gone back to press again. So the very few out of the hundred and some we had up there, that's it. We're not going to get any more while Rupert is here. But for so. enough money, I'll come and copy it out by hand. It might take a while. Um, or if you want me to type it on a Selectric, you know, one of those modern. Right. We should have one of those espresso machines, you know, which you can actually buy from the bookstore and it will spit out the book. Yeah. Browning and whining and costing a fortune. Uh, but anyway, um, for a long time, I've been friends with Rupert's publisher, Jonathan Carp, for a really long time. Um, over at Dare, at, he, at ABA, he was giving out a advanced reading copy of a nonfiction book. And I said to him, if you can get the author to sign this, I will sell 100 copies. He said, there's no way. Guess what? I did. <laughs> um, anyway, it was, a, it was a terrific book. It had to do with um, diving for a wreck. I can't remember the name of it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Jonathan did a very moving um, discussion, sort of a video for booksellers and all, about how hard it was to get Rupert to write another book. Because it has been such a long time. Mm -hmm. So what did you move you to write another book after ever been twenty Yeah, uh, uh, you know, know the sixteen years. Yeah. This this is my third novel and I took longer to write this third novel than any other. I had the idea for it, um I guess a dozen years ago. And I wrote a lot of the foreword in this book. There's there are two narrators in Murder Your Employer. One is the Dean Harbinger Harrow, who is the uh, Dean of Admissions and Confessions um, <laughs> at this, this sinister uh, Poison Ivy League college. Hogwarts <laughs> kind of made into Harvard is what it really is. And I wrote the uh, foreword that begins the book. Um, a dozen years ago, and I instantly knew the tone of his narration, and so then I set about um, creating this this campus in my mind, at the, and I needed to know where absolutely every building was, what its purpose was, where the poison gardens were, where the um, menagerie of uh, killing little deadly killing living things was, <laughs> uh, where the snake pit would be. I wanted to know what the uh, dining hall looked like. It has a secret um, three-star rating from the Guide Michelin. Um, and uh, all the various features of the campus. And then the really challenging part was, if this is a school where you learn how to murder a deserving victim, and that's the only kind of person that gets murdered here, someone who really has it coming to them. Um, and I, I needed to know what the curriculum of this school would be in murder your employer. So I had to invent like courses and think out what they would consist of. Um, my favorite uh, school in the McMaster's campus is the school of eroticide, <laughs> where, where, where it's advised that after all, keep in mind, uh, Cupid is armed and dangerous. He has those arrows. And uh, and romance, seduction, uh, uh, infidelity, uh, rejection are all arsenals in the McMaster's um, school. And what I loved about the School of Eroticide is that they had to make it a mandatory course 
because while women were perfectly willing to be educated and their minds improved on this subject, all the men thought they already knew everything they had to know. <laughs> so, um, so that was fun. And like, mathematical courses, odds and getting even, um, uh, courses like uh, science courses like time is relative when you're murdering one. Um, uh, so it was just an entire curriculum that I had to come up with. And when he, uh, our, my primary hero, um, in roles, he's got a whole schedule worked out, and and I had to invent like you know what would be the twenty three courses he would take to um, master um, the art the, to make master the art of murder. So um, so that took a long time too. So I, your addiction to puns kind of <laughs> it has been called a pun fest. Yeah. yeah. It has. Well, Dean, the Dean narrates uh, a lot of it, and the tone is pretty droll. And he's British to the core. And I was born in England and brought up with a dual upbringing. My mother was solid British and always felt that the American Revolution was a diplomatic blunder on George Washington's part and that it all would be soon rectified. Whereas my father was a, an outgoing, brash American jazz musician who was stationed in, um, in um, uh, Cheshire, the county of Cheshire. That's where he met my mother. And I was born in England. And I was a proper good English boy till I was about three. I must have had a British accent for a while. And then one day my parents turned to me and said, um, we're going to a place called Long Island. <laughs> and I thought, pirates, <laughs> palm trees. And then we moved to Levittown. Which, uh, the first sentence I heard in the United States was from a kid my age who turned to me and said, get out of my property. Get out of my property. My English accent lasted for about 23 minutes, and then I was a full-blown American boy. Um, but uh, so, so Dean Harbinger Harrow is very British, and he loves his puns, and uh, many of the courses have a, 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 a sort of a wink in them. Uh, but then my other narrator is a young man, Cliff Iverson, who has, has no knowledge of McMaster's, of the McMaster's Conservative, Conservatory for the Applied Arts. And at the beginning of the novel, he tries to murder a, an employer who deserves a fate no worse but no better than death. A terrible man who uh, is responsible for destroying my hero Cliff's reputation in the field of aeronautics. He's an, aeron he's a, an aeronautic designer. He's responsible for the death of the girl, that, uh, for the woman, young woman that uh, Cliff loved. And he is also responsible for allowing a plane to be manufactured in large numbers that has some structural defects that he knows full well about that could bring about the death of literally hundreds, possibly thousands of people when something goes wrong. And so Cliff decides that he will be doing the world a favor by getting rid of this man and tries to commit a murder and is very pleased to come up with a perfect murder method uh, which seems to work for about uh, 15 seconds and then he realizes that he has committed a very bad murder and he's going to be caught and the only thing that saves him is that the police who come to arrest him immediately thereafter turn out to be representatives of the master's school they're not real police they're former police and um, what Cliff doesn't know is that he has a sponsor sort of like um, in Great Expectations and uh, he has someone, an anonymous sponsor, who wants him to have the benefit of the very expensive education at McMaster's so that he can do a proper job of the murder he wants to commit. And so Cliff arrives there at McMaster's knowing nothing about the place. And so you get to learn about McMaster's as he does, not knowing anything about it before the day that, that he arrives. And, um, and so Cliff doesn't engage in quite the same punnery that the Dean does. It's the Dean's <laughs> tradition, Cliff's a, a, a regular American guy, a decent guy. Sort of a Monty Python kind yeah, of a thing, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. is there any kind of ticking clock going on if the guy is really that big a danger? How long is it going to take Cliff to go through this curriculum in order to successfully off him? Well, he tries to escape from McMaster's the very first day because he knows that this man is still out there. Right. And again, um, just as I would be, he's very happy at how successfully he's escaped. Only, of course, to learn that every move he's made has been anticipated by the college, and he's <laughs> right back where he started. Then he decides, well, in for penny, in for pound, and decides that um, 
he will make the most of this incredible opportunity, try to master this art, and uh, goes about conceiving his McMaster's thesis. We, by the way, if you're a McMaster's uh, student, you aren't committing a murder, you're committing a deletion. Uh, the object is to delete these people. Um, uh, it, it, murder sounds so subjective. You know, it's, it's such a who can say what murder. Is. So, uh, so he gets to it. It doesn't take him long. He does a, a one good full term, and he's. They decide he's ready to go up back out into the real world and see if he can uh, do a successful thesis. So he's either an F student or a prison student. He was, yeah. He turns out to be an F, uh, in the beginning. He's a, um, a total washout. And by the way, it's a little scary at McMaster's because since the existence of McMaster's is a total secret, um, and if you're studying there, you know the secret that it exists. If you fail <laughs> at your thesis, if you do not succeed in your task, um, the campus is obliged to expunge you from the student body, uh, and there are no uh, makeup exams. So you yourself are studying, knowing that you want to succeed, that you must succeed, and if, that if you don't succeed, you will be the victim, be not victim. your victim being the victim. So it adds a lot of suspense from the outset, because it's sort of kill or be killed, even though they're the most genteel people, and it's a You'd all love to spend two weeks at McMaster's if you didn't have to study murder. You'd just like to be there. It's a wonderful place to be. It's beautiful. So have you created a school song? <laughs> um, well, the school song is, is, a, is a top secret because it's also a, 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 a humming the school song is a password to other people who are out there who are McMaster's graduates. It used to be, at one time, the school fight song was the song Murder, uh, murder He Said by uh, Betty Hutton, um, murder, he said, but uh, they did away with that. So I, I can't reveal to you what the school song is because it's a, a secret code. I'm not even making that up, it's in the book. <laughs> so, sounds like everything I make, it sounds like I'm making it all up as I go along. It actually took a long time to work all this stuff out, yeah. like the ending of The Mystery of Edwin Drew. It's a very elaborate construct. It is. It really is. So... I, was, I was fortunate in that I asked um, the set designer for the revival of the mystery of Edwin Drood, um, and also for another murder mystery musical I wrote with Candor Neb, the great Candor Neb of Chicago and Cabaret, uh, we wrote a third C letter musical called Curtains, which starred David Hyde Pierce. Um, I wish I also would which you also I, a compliment to you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, right? And your presence there was a compliment to us all. Well, uh, but, um, uh, so she designed the sets for that and for um, a version of uh, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. And I asked her to do illustrations for Murder, Your Employer. And on top of which, she created the most gorgeous map, mm -hmm. which is the end pages of the novel. If you look there, you'll just see it within. And don't you love, don't you love a book that's got a map? Yeah. And you can, as you're, as you're reading, you can sort of see where you are on campus. You don't get a lot of those these days, and no. uh, it was an extra expenditure by um, Avid Reader Press and Simon & Schuster to include that. And uh, if you go to my website, RupertHolmes.com, you'll see a watercolor rendition she did of it as well floating in the background. Um, I just love having it. And she adapted it from some of the worst sketches she's ever seen that I drew of what I thought the campus looked like. That's beautiful. So in a way, comedic mystery is kind of a... Is ironic or a contradiction in terms, right? It isn't easy to make it funny. Comedy and mystery. Comedy. I've written a number of comedy thrillers, um, and uh, a couple of them have been done uh, in the area here at the Fountain Hills Theater, and uh, a number for Broadway. And I find that comedy and thrillers are a good combination because you build up tension, and then you are able to momentarily release the tension with laughter. And I find, you know, the best analogy I've come up with for that, and it only occurred to me the other day, is is um, is a roller coaster ride, <laughs> uh, because when you whether you're on the ride or you're on the ground watching the people on, you hear screams as that initial drop takes place. It's human nature. You're screaming. You're falling from a tremendous height, head first, and then usually at the uh, cars, the, the roller coaster cars, sort of 
peek out at the bottom, you hear the screams turn to laughter. The reason there's laughter and you can't help it is you know you should be dead. <laughs> you should be dead. And, and somehow you've done something that your body is saying, this is the end of your life. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> and people, so you hear screams. Some screams just continue screams the whole ride. But some people can't help but laugh hysterically at the escape. It's the difference between skydiving, and this is what I feel about murder mysteries. It's the difference between skydiving and falling off a building. <laughs> when you fall off a building, the bad news is you know you don't have a parachute. When you skydive, you say, you may be frightened, but you're saying this is incredible, and I know I have a parachute. Your conscious mind is overriding the fact that you know you're doomed. You're saying, I'm not doomed. I've got a bailout. And I always think of mysteries as a place where we can go and kind of feel the fear and the mystery and the paranoia and the terror of someone who is not what they present themselves to be. Um, our lives, we have people who say they are our friends and we later learn, no, not really. And uh, mysteries are like that. We know that someone in this pool of people who are suspects is not rooting for you as much as they might claim to. And uh, we can experience all that within a mystery, knowing that at any point we can close the book and it's not our life. Or we can reach the end of the book and feel satisfied that there is justice and that wrongs are righted and that bad people get what's coming to them. So um, I find that comedy and mystery go really hand in hand, just like on a roller coaster, you screaming for your dear life and happy to know that you still have one. Years ago, when I was interviewing P.E. James here, I remember her saying how pleasurable it was to lie in bed reading a book and knowing that the footstep on the stairs was not really coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> so part of it is also it's nice to scare yourself in a safe environment that's exactly, exactly what, I'm saying. what you're saying that, that's yeah. what a roller coaster is you're saying how right. can i have the terror of my right. the most and people line up they queue up they can't wait it's the highest one yet it's got you'll go upside down and backwards and then you repeat the other thing and the whole thing is reverse and you say <laughs> that's a terrible idea of something to do but you're going to come as close as you possibly can to a completely deadly situation and know that someone, unless they've screwed up, that someone has seen to it that you will survive this entire terrifying experience. So that's so great. That's the whole catharsis thing. Yeah, right. It, it really is. It's why the dark rides are so popular at Disneyland. Well, what do you want to go to? The Haunted Mansion. Even when you were a kid, uh, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride and the Snow White Ride terrified the bejabbers out of kids that's a scary they actually call it i think snow white scary ride i think just to kind of warn people but you're go, you're delving into these worlds saying you're going to be scared but it's not as scary as being in an alley an alleyway on avenue b at two in the morning and this is not a ride and i didn't buy a ticket and i'm looking for an exit desperately so, catharsis you're right so you are constantly creating things. Do you have another book in mind? Or yeah. what is your current project? My current project, no, not kidding. My current project is, and I'm almost done, is really? volume two. This is, this is, you, it says volume one. That's not a joke. Uh, volume two. Um, and I will tell you, share with you, that at least at the moment, the title is Murder Your Mate. And, uh, <laughs> and I think that's and how I handle that. It's very... Very challenging how to handle this because the goal with this book and my editor John Carp said I don't know if you can do this but when I was done he said and and all the reviews that I read online and from real readers and stuff it all kind of emphasizes this I the goal was can I make you root for three murders because we focus on three students in particular one clip who I've described to you but two women one, a very a nice British nurse who's under the thumb of her superior at the hospital um, and because of something that that superior has over her, and she's destroying her life. And the third is a Hollywood star, a film star, whose career is being completely crushed by a movie studio head 
who she, uh, whose sexual advances uh, she has rebuffed. And so he's decided she will never make another picture again. So you thought about Harvey Weinstein. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what's interesting. Yeah. I started writing that character, and many of these people, um, as I say, a dozen years ago, right. 10 years ago. And I'm kind of upset because... Because Harvey took his in Harvey real life. Huh? Showed, Harvey showed up in reality, right. and Harvey is very... One is the movie mogul, but I had another character, Cliff's enemy, uh, is, is even worse than that with women. And as I was writing that, I, I wrote, I thought to myself, people are going to think that this is based on Harvey Weinstein. And it's not. It's I just tried to think of everything I could do to make you root for the people who are going to kill these people. <laughs> and the funny thing is, one of the words I see cropping up in a lot of the re reviews are, are words like wholesome. <laughs> I'm not making this up. It's like a feel-good book. Who could have thought a book about murdering people could be a, a, a feel-good experience? And yet everyone says the ending, very satisfying. Oh, I hope they go on. Will they be in the next volume? And the answer is yes. Uh, so I've established a lot of characters here who will be continuing on in volume two, hopefully three. My goal is to write one of these a year for the next 25 years. <laughs> and then I will lay down my pen at 101. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I can't help but think that you've written this book. Success in publishing sometimes comes in hitting the zeitgeist of the moment. How many of us over the last few years have thought, seriously, if we could just kill one person, <laughs> we could just do it. Right. And, you know, I, I had this discussion with Peter Swanson because I did a Zoom event this afternoon at four came before I came down here. And we were we were talking about the same sort of thing, you know, that if we had the power to... Well, erase someone. You, here's you know, the thing that we would would we do it? I, Which is the more moral act? Well, I here's guess, here's the deal. Real this, question. this was I did two things in the book that that are designed to let you allow yourself to entertain this idea. Because I've I've often said um, when I'm with audiences, I, I say if you could um, take one person who's been cruel to you, taken something from you, set back your life in some way, if you could. Get rid of them with complete impunity. Who would you choose? Uh, just think for a second. And then I say, oh, well, now I've got you. Because you started to consider. And you may be reviewing that. Here's what I've realized. That um, um, uh, we all say, I can't imagine anyone who's ever gone their life and not said, I could just kill him, her, them. Okay, we never do anything about that. But we do say it. But what we sometimes also say on a much more, less exclamatory and more personal, emotional level, we sometimes say, gee, I wish I'd never met them. Mm -hmm. Gee, I wish I'd never crossed their path. Mm -hmm. And that's a real thing. And, and sometimes we even go a little farther. And we say, with, without malice of forethought, we say, well, I wish they'd never been born. They've never done anybody any good. All they take pleasure in is someone else's um, hurt. And, uh, and it's only a step from that kind of sentiment to go from saying, I could just kill him, to saying, I could just kill him. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's all in the inflection. It's all in the inflection. <laughs> and, and so the point of, of the way we set up McMaster's is is to um, is is to do everything I can to let you entertain this forbidden notion, and 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 the secret for me was to come up with the four inquiries. Um, can I can I read from this book? Sure. Okay. Whatever you find. Yeah. Well, no. Ju I just uh, I can do them from memory, but maybe it'll help me if I do them from the book. Um, so, the dean says in the foreword. Um, um, for those who have consulted this guy, because you are not yet certain if murder is your best option, this is all very, <laughs> it's all very scholarly, you understand. Um, I would say that this decision should not be made lightly. <laughs> Homicide, after all, is a life-changing event, especially for your victim. And uh, before moving forward, you should ask yourself what has come to be known 
at freshman <laughs> orientation as the four inquiries. One, is this murder necessary? Are you murdering your CEO without first attempting to woo their son or daughter? <laughs> How foolish you would feel having committed your crime uh, with all its risks and travails, only to learn there'd been no need. This would surely be overkill in the most literal sense of the word. <laughs> Two, have you given your target every last chance to redeem themselves? You will sleep better the night after your murder if you know that on the day before it, you gave your target every opportunity to wake the next morning. If they refuse to reform, you can proceed with a clear conscience after all. When the behavior of another person leaves you no choice but to kill them, their murder is simply involuntary suicide. <laughs> Three, what innocent person might suffer by your actions? Do not ask for whom the bell tolls. Ask who would mourn in hearing it. If answer comes there, none. Then if, for example, you were planning an, an electrocution, more power to you. <laughs> or, will distillation improve the life of others? At the end of the day, when our work is done, may every McMaster's alumnus be able to say that the world has been left a better place because their adversary is no longer in it. And now read on with my fervent hope that the only justice you ever face will be poetic. And during the course of your tutelage, I hope you will come to better understand and appreciate the remarkable frailty of all life, and that you will learn to live each day as if it might be your victim's life. <laughs> so I think that once you've answered those four questions, you can sort of say, well, yeah, I guess it's sort of, uh, yeah, I can, I can see moral that. murder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Moral I'm, murder. I'm yeah. juggling morality and pretty well, you are. I mean, but, you're avoiding the platonic question, who shall govern the governors? But, yeah, you know, yeah, but yeah. not what they yeah. Well, that ain't coming up in my no. head at all. <laughs> so, so volume two to come. So how about questions from the audience? Would any of you like to ask something? Yes, what please. What does your writing process look like? Um, sometimes illegible. <laughs> um, my writing process, um, my writing process is interesting. I. I learned an, a, a lesson about myself and my own way of writing uh, when in, in, in the mid-1990s, I wrote a TV series. I created it and wrote uh, 56 episodes of a TV series called Remember When, W-E-N-N, -N, which was uh, about uh, set in the golden age of radio in 1939. And a fabulous cast of Broadway actors, no commercials, yeah. no laugh track, the best thing for any writer in the world. No artificial cliffhangers. And uh, um, just tell the story in 28 minutes, and you'd be amazed how much you can get in 28 minutes when there's no commercials. Mm -hmm. And um, But we were on a very tight budget. We were AMC's very first series, preceding Mad Men. And uh, I was the only one who seemed to be able to get the tone of the series, so I wrote virtually um, uh, every episode. Um, more episodes than Carl Reiner wrote of The Dick Van Dyke Show. And um, um, I would sometimes have to sit down, Barbara, on a Thursday to write an episode that would be filmed on a Monday. That is the most ghastly pressure. You, because if I got blocked, we'd be, we couldn't afford to lose a week's budget. We'd be off the air. So I had to come up with a script. And the lesson I learned was that um, when I get stuck, uh, don't try to be a writer and say, what clever thing can I write next? If you believe in your characters, as I believe in the characters in Murder, Your Employer, and I really know them, just think, well, what would they do? Don't think, what can you invent for them to do? What would they actually do, knowing what you know about them and given the circumstances they're in? And invariably, they lead me to someone. And I, am, I become, when I'm writing well, that you're asking about my process. I feel completely, this happened on Remember When, and it happened on my second novel, um, and it happened on my third, um, this one. Um, I just feel like a stenographer at times. I feel like I'm, I, I'm just taking it all down, and I can't type fast enough to keep up with what they're thinking, doing, and saying. And most of the time, there are a lot of people will come up with lines. The, the, the Hollywood starlet, someone turns to her and say, I'm sorry, I wasn't 
I, I wasn't hearing, I was buried in thought, and the starlet's at the, she's not a starlet, Hollywood star, she's like Betty Davis a little bit. And someone says, I'm sorry, I was buried in thought. She says, yes, and I'm sure it was a shallow grave. <laughs> and, and I didn't say that. I didn't invent that. She said it. And I, as I typed it, thought, <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> and, 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 and my characters, when they make jokes, they're coming out of the moment, and I say, oh, that was funny. And then I sort of feel proud of them that they've done so well. And I laugh as if I've heard it for the first time, even though it came out of my brain. So it's a, once I get my characters set, once I know the basic, I mean, I know what the big twists and bumps are going to be. And then as I know that's my goal to get there, they take me the route. When, when one of the characters goes a, uh, for a walk on the McMaster's campus and something, they discover something that helps them, I sometimes don't know where they're going, but I follow them. And it sound, this sounds all stupid. I'm not stupid, but like I'm making it up. But it's true. Uh, in the first novel, um, my, I believed so much in my uh, protagonist, a young woman, that, that, and I got to a certain point where she was in a crisis where both men to whom she's presented herself as being a completely different person are both going to arrive at the same time, and she's going to be caught. And I thought, what's she going to do? I said, well, let's see what she does. And she, for four chapters, I'm following what she does out of this situation. It would be logical for her to do until finally she's taking a flight she never meant to take to New York because she got boxed in by this and that. And now she's on her way to Hollywood, Florida. And it was all because she was just responding in a world that I believed in within her character. So it's, I type. I'm lucky that I'm a very fast typist because it's all I can do to keep up with my characters. And they are, they are the narrators. They are who. They are the people that are deciding what happens to them. And sometimes I have an outline. I've heard other writers say this. This is true for me. I have an outline. I know exactly what the characters are going to do. And when I get them to that point, they won't go there. They don't want to do it. It's against their nature. And when that happens, I have to be prepared to say, scrap that plan A. What What's your better idea, character? And they say, well, I would go there. And I always know something's good something good is happening in, when I'm writing. When they use something that I put in the book earlier that was never meant to serve any purpose beyond that moment. It's kind of like in, in the writing of Casablanca where the Epstein brothers didn't know how to get Bogart and out of a situation. And suddenly they looked at each other and said, round up the usual suspects, which was a line that was used earlier in the screenplay for another moment. Mm -hmm. And they realized that the thing they had put in as a kind of one-liner gag at the beginning was in fact, somehow subconsciously, they knew that was gonna be the doorway to saving Bogart in a moment of crisis. Just that they would repeat it, the audience would understand it because they had heard it in its original context. And of course, yes, that will get Bogart out of the situation safely. So. So whenever I find that the things I put in the book for humor or a description of an area, and somehow I say, oh, well, they would go back there, wouldn't they? That's the one place that they know they could. So people go back to a site that they visited. The first time I was taking you there, it was for sightseeing purposes and to show you the campus. The second time they go back, it's because it was the perfect place on campus for them to go at that moment. and and. Dramatic things happened there, but I didn't put it in the book for that purpose. So that, that's a very long answer to uh, how my process is. I can't work longhand anymore because I can't keep up. I can't write that fast. I have to type. You could also dictate. Can you do that? I you can. know, Earl Stanley Garden dictated those Perry Mason novels. You know, there'd be Barbara Kirkland apparently dictated all of her I just books. don't see it. Now, in the case of Earl Stanley Garden, and I love reading a good Perry Mason, especially the early book. But like it'll say, Mason looked out over the city, which was gray on a cynical um, Los Angeles morning. And I think, well, that's all the description we're going to get in the entire novel. That's it, because it's all dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. And he's in court, and it's all sentence, sentence, answer, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. Um, I don't think I could ever. Do I don't know how that. That's a crap. But Barbara Carlin does it great. You know, so. I, mean, I can't deal with audio books. I can only deal with the actual written words. So we all. It all depends on how our mind works. I drive publishers crazy because they say, you know, here's a PDF, and I go, no, 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 you know, not going to work. You have to send me an actual book.
<laughs> so anybody else have a question? If we've left you stunned, then we can move to signing. Yes. I mentioned the audio books. Most of us know you from going all the way back to the 70s and the music. Yeah. You're very entertaining. Uh, are your publishers pressuring you to do audio book versions of these things in your own voice? But, um, you know, um, that's a special thing. Yeah. Um, there have been audio books of all three of my novels. Um, um, one of them, uh, one of the people got the character wrong. You, by the way, they don't, there may be exceptions to this. As the author, they don't want you around for the recording of the audio book. My mom did one, but it was autobiographical. I think. Oh, well, that's, a that's different. different. If I wrote my memoir, I wouldn't want to hear me. <laughs> Can you imagine an autobiography, but where it's being read, you know, um, yeah. Richard Milhouse Nixon's autobiography read by um, um, Eric Estrada. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, uh, but I, in this case, I have two wonderful narrators for the audio book. But by the book, there's nothing like having the book, you know. But 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 in this case, uh, the narrator, when when it's in the voice of Dean Harbinger Harold, the very British fellow, is Simon Vance, who is just really outstanding. Won about 37 gazillion awards, and he's got just the right tone of the droll, dry British wit. And then my hero, Cliff Iverson, he in the book, his chapters are all in the first person which makes for a refreshing change, I think, going from third person, omniscient narrator, mm -hmm. to a first person that you get to know as a, as, a, as, a, as a friend. And the reason he's doing that is because, sort of like, you know those commercials where they say, each month you will receive a letter from the child you have sponsored. You know, you'll get a letter from them telling of their progress. Well, he's, Cliff is uh, a sponsored student. He doesn't know to whom he's writing, but he has the obligation to keep a journal of his experiences both on campus and then afterward um, in the first person. So that his chapters are done in the first person by the wonderful and witty uh, actor, uh, Neil Patrick Harris. Oh, uh, oh. So who fits that oh, to yeah. a tee. Um, and uh, who's always taken a great interest in mysteries. And um, I remember my first comedy thriller that was not a musical. I was at the Pasadena Playhouse with it. We had a long run and I was doing a QA. and a and I'm getting these very intelligent questions from a young man. And I'm looking at the young man, and I think to myself, that's Doogie Howser. <laughs> and, and it was a, 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 a growing, changing Doogie Howser. And Neil Patrick Harris loves mysteries, and, uh, and he did a superb job on this, voicing all the characters quite authentically. So, so I've been very lucky in this book. In this book. So my recommendation is you can buy both and you can uh -huh. listen in the car and then you can uh -huh. go back to the book or if you're in the commuter area, which we don't have here, you can do that. So, so let's thank Rupert for a really wonderful conversation. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.